Well, welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight and to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Episode 71, with Mark Boardman from Vortex Optics. We are continuing our Building a Backcountry Rifle series and excited to get into the topics of scope selection this evening. There's a lot to consider, from magnification ranges to objective sizes, glass clarity, coatings. There's so many things that go into a scope. We cut through all of these facts, all of the stats, and really get to what do you need to consider when you are picking out a scope for your backcountry rifle. Thanks so much to Mark and Vortex for joining us sharing this information with us. It is going to be a great show. Before we get into that, I want to give a shout out to Howard Fine, who left us a review on iTunes. Howard, please send us your shipping information to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Listeners, if you want to enter into these giveaways, it's really simple. Just consider leaving us a review in iTunes or email us with your questions, comments, or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Also, a big thank you to Weatherby for helping us make this Building a Backcountry Rifle series possible. Steve and I have been nothing but impressed with our Vanguard series rifles. We are shooting the Backcountry model specifically, but in the Vanguard series, there is a rifle for every budget and almost every need. Be sure to check out the entire lineup at weatherby.com. Okay, let's get right into this discussion on scope selection for your Backcountry Rifle with Vortex Optics. Well, Mark, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing well, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Busy in the Vortex offices this time of year? It is, it is. You know, a lot of stuff going on. You know, like you mentioned, you know, the year and with uh, the new year upon us, you know, just getting ready with catalogs and new products and show season and all sorts of exciting stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's that time of year. I know, Steve, you're what, online as well. You're getting ready to What about to you guys? To... Uh, Steve's heading to ATA uh, here in just a bit, yeah. and as well as shot. I'm actually ducking out this year just because uh, time commitments and some other things going on. But, man, I'll probably miss being out at them because I'm, I'm used to hitting the shows, and it's certainly a fun time. I know, yeah. I mean, it can definitely be a little double-edged. I mean, you definitely, you know, you hit that circuit. It can be a bit of a grind, but... You know, then, like you said, if you don't go, you miss seeing all all the different people you're accustomed to seeing at least once a year, you know, getting to visit with and chat and tell hunt stories, check out new products and see what everybody's up to. So, but uh, yeah, it, it, it can definitely be a, uh, an, an interesting time of year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, know you guys at Vortex, you kind of recently uh, announced or released some details, at least, of new things for 2017. Um, is there anything else coming? Not that you have to spill the beans now, but was that kind of the all the updates that you released there? So, yeah, so we've got some some really exciting stuff coming out. You know, um, the, the on the rifle scope side of things, uh, you know, historically the Viper PST series has been um, just, you know, the quintessential – uh, you know, bang for the buck, for lack of a better term, you know, tactical optic. I mean, super feature rich, um, you know, incredible optics, but, you know, at a price point that's, you know, definitely more within reach, I would say, than, than uh, you know, I'd say similar rifle scopes with similar features. And this year, um, you know, the Viper PST series still carries that PST name, but it's the Gen 2 version. And, uh, man, they're, they're off the charts. I mean, so kind of, you know, of course how we feel, you know, feel like we took, you know, one of the best, you know, tactical rifle scopes on the market and, and made it better, you know? So, um, really excited about those as well as, you know, I'd say, oh, of course there's a lot of crossover with those tons of guys use them to hunt, you know, big game. Um, but we introduced or are introducing a, uh, our fury, uh, range finding binocular, which is, uh, another one that we're, we're really excited about. So, you know, for the, for the person who's trying to, 
you know, game dual purpose functionality. Um, you know, if, if you're an outfitter and, and you're trying to, you know, uh, range and call shots, hits, misses, um, for a client, um, man, it, it's, it's going to be a piece that's going to be tough to beat. That's cool. Does that have a uh, angle compensation, everything built into it? So it does. You're going to have two modes. Um, you know, I mean, that's another really nice thing about it actually, as far as the menu and accessing, um, you know, the different modes, brightness settings, pretty simple, self-explanatory, or maybe not self-explanatory, but if you read the directions, um, which I know a lot of us fail to do, um, you know, you'll be able to get it right away. And heck, it's, it's so simple. But even if you didn't read the directions, you'd probably be able to, to get through it. No problem. But so, yeah, you so see, you've got an angle compensated mode, um, which that's going to be the primary, you know, one that most guys are going to just leave it in. That's what it's going to come in. And you'll just, you'll just leave it in there. Um, it does have a line of sight mode um, as well, which is just going to give you kind of that, um, you know, number where it comes in useful for guys that are using ballistics calculators and would get into uh, more high angle shooting. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, let's uh, let's back up and introduce yourself, Mark. We got so excited talking about gear that's coming. Um, you're in marketing with Vortex Optics. Uh, that's you know what we're here to talk about today is just really choosing a rifle scope for these builds that Steve and I are doing. Um, you know, for big game hunting. Uh, in the back country. And, you know, one thing I, I appreciate in talking with you in the past is, you know, as I was talking to you about scope selection and things like that, you weren't just giving us theoreticals, but you were telling me how you use this scope on this hunt and, you know, another scope on that hunt. And so go ahead and give us some context of, um, you know, your position at Vortex a little bit more, as well as how you spend time in the field um, and kind of a little bit of uh, your hunting experience, things like that. So, yeah, so like I said, you know, um, Mark Born with Vortex, I've been with the company probably going on eight years now. Um, I'm originally from Washington State, um, and yeah, man, grew up in a hunting and fishing family. So, um, man, my my earliest memories and, you know, I'd say most of my best memories, you know, involve, uh, involve you know, hunting and fishing in some sort of capacity. So, um, yeah, finished, finished school out at the Washington state university. So, you know, go Cougs for any Cougs that are out there <laughs> and, uh, realized, uh, you know, I definitely got a solid education, but, you know, like I said, always been passionate about hunting and fishing and knew that I wanted to do something, um, you know, where I could tie, you know, my work and daily life into it. So, um, yeah, a couple, couple outdoor retail shops later. Um, and, uh, I ended up uh, actually working for Cabela's at their corporate headquarters in Sydney, Nebraska, which was a phenomenal job. Um, great company, great people, um, super strong hunting, fishing culture, and, uh, you know, found Vortex and, and, and made the move over here, like I said, about eight years ago and haven't looked back. It's been an amazing ride. Again, you know, awesome company, awesome people, amazing products. You know, that's one thing that's really nice. It's nice to be able to, um, feel good about, uh, you know, what you're selling, what you're promoting, what you're talking about. And, uh, you know, um, of course I always sit in my vortex chair, right. But I feel like we have, you know, definitely, uh, a lot of the best products out there. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Right. So is vortex is in Wisconsin. Is that right? So, yeah, so we're based out of Wisconsin. So yeah, I, ne yeah. I never thought I'd leave the coast and, uh, <laughs> I keep moving east, but I, I guess as long as I, as long as I don't end up, you know, uh, too far, too far east. I guess we'll be good to go. <laughs> how's, how's the hunting and how's the hunting and fishing up there? You know, it's really cool. I mean, it's different. You know, it's different from the west for sure. Um, but um, really, you know, the whitetail hunting is phenomenal. Long seasons. I mean, heck, you know, I mean that's one thing that's nice about here. Um, you know, if you if you like to hunt deer, you can basically do it from you know September through the beginning of January, right? So there's there's some sort of season going on, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but I'd say, you know, uh, um, some, some, some good waterfowling as well, um, good turkey hunting. So I'd say predominantly, you know, what people focus on here most would be, you know, the, the whitetail and the turkey hunting. But, you know, some good predator hunting, you know, you can mix it up a little bit with that as well. Um, upland birds, you know, grouse up north. Um, so uh, enough, enough to stay busy, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Nice. I, know, I know you got on quite a few hunts. What was kind of the highlight of uh, 2016 for you? Oh man. Yeah. I had, uh, was able to get out, you know, a handful of times, um, you know, even, even out here, I think, you know, 
I think everybody likes home, right? So I try to get out west as much as I can. So I didn't make it back to Washington, but um, I did make it to um, Prince of Wales and Prince of Wales Island in August, and so I did a, uh, an alpine hunt uh, with a buddy up there, uh, Jesse Knox. So we bombed into a lake uh, in a in a 185, and uh, you know hit uh, hit the high country and. Um, just, uh, I've wanted to do that hunt for so long and, uh, it was, I mean, it was everything you could have expected to be. It's definitely true Alaska. Uh, I mean, I'd say defined by, you know, at least our hunt was defined by fog, rain and bears. So we actually, uh, spent a, you know, a lot of tent time, saw a lot of bears. We had one day where we actually had the weather broke enough that, uh, we were, we were able to hunt, um, it's just pretty gnarly country up there. You just don't want to move around too much when, when you can't see, you know? And, mm-hmm. uh, but so I ended up killing a, killing a deer that morning, um, with that razor HDLH one and a half to eight that we'll probably be talking about later. Indeed. Um, and you know, made the summit, you know, that afternoon, um, which was cool. It was just beautiful up there and proceeded to, uh, glass up bears on the side. We came up all over that face. I mean, it was like, I mean, there wasn't a time where you probably couldn't see multiple bears, uh, including a couple that were pacing back and forth where we hung, uh, hung that deer off a cliff. So, wow. um, yeah. <laughs> so you were able to hang it like, story. you were able to hang it off the cliff Sorry, kind what? of out of reach of those bears or how did that work? So, yeah, that was the plan at least. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, there really wasn't any trees up there. So there was, you know, a pretty good cliff face. I'd say it was probably about a 30 footer and, uh, with a root wad at the top. So we just hung all the meat and game bags, you know, off, off that root wad. Um, and when we got down that night, um, they'd pulled one of the bags up and, you know, it was definitely hung a little bit higher when we hung it. I mean, it's always a concern up there and we'd seen a couple bears, um, and, and, you know, a fair amount of bear sign, but, you know, I guess in my mind, you know, the biggest thing was like, oh, we just need to have the air circulating, right? So, um, just the way everything got cut, you know, we hung um, one of the bags and the head, which was connected to the head, was hung a, a little bit higher. So they got that one up, uh, which was mostly the scraps and, and a couple other things. Um, it was the smallest bag, and it was tied to the tied to the head. And uh, so they ate all the meat out of that. They left the head alone. So then when we got back down, we and we're like, okay, well, that sucks. And we considered moving it, um, but there just wasn't – it was definitely the, the best place to do it. So we knew the Bears knew that it was there, um, but it was also where we felt it would be the most, you know, out of reach. So we re- rehung everything, what we thought was better, um, and went down to camp. The next day was actually another weather day. We were going to come back up the next morning and uh and make our way back down to the lake um but it was just the big storm came in it was just too nasty and so we spent another night on the mountain and when we went back the next day uh it was like it uh it was like it was never there it was bizarre we just like wow. looked up and it was gone like and, and we we scoured the you know the mountainside for several hours just trying to find you know a game bag or where they'd maybe stash something where you know it still might mm-hmm. be good and it was crazy, man. I think I think they ate the game bags. Like it was, it was just gone. <laughs> <laughs> so hindsight, did you ever? No, go ahead, just, did you ever feel uh, in danger from the bears personally? Get too close or you're uncomfortable? I mean, yeah, they, there was definitely you know that night that we had killed that deer. Um, you know, we did. You know, we probably hiked for only about twenty minutes. You know, um, by foot. You know, where we where we shot that buck from. Um, which in that country, that's, you know, really not that far. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, I'd say I was definitely nervous a little bit, but I mean, I guess you kind of have to accept that they're out there. Um, and there's really nothing you can do about it. So, but that night when we came back, you know, after they'd gotten into that, um, that carcass a little bit, um, there was a bear 50 yards from camp. So we chased that bear off and then just minutes later, Another bear was coming down to shoot probably about 100 yards away, so we yelled at that bear, and it ran off. And then we <laughs> looked up, and there was another bear like 100 yards above us just sitting on its, sitting on its ass, just like looking down at us. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So that was, that was a little bit of, uh, you know, you know. luckily you're pretty tired, you know, at yeah. the end of the day. Like we hunted right. that day, did a lot of hiking. But I did, 
I did come up with a good um, strategy for that, though, because I could I could hear something in my, you know, I thought I could hear something outside the tent, you know, so I was like, Jesse, do you hear something? He's like, no, I don't hear anything. What do you hear, you know? And I'm like, well, it turned out to be like uh, a piece of my tent fabric was just kind of, you know, Whipping, like rubbing yeah. or flapping in the breeze. Yeah. But um, the nice thing was it got him super amped up and freaked out. Um, which I shouldn't say freaked out because I don't think he was super worried, but um, that I think he, he laid awake, uh, you know, standing guard for a while. <laughs> once, actually, once I figured out that, once I figured out, my, my, he goes, dude, once you said that, that was your 10, he goes, you were saw logs like two minutes later. He's like, I was up for the next two hours. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's, that's a good tactic. Just play into your partner's head, get them all amped out, and then just sleep like a baby. <laughs> Yeah, just yeah, just stack out, you know. So, but it was it was like yeah, it was a cool hunt, man. Like I wouldn't change it. It was true Alaska, um, and you know, I mean, that's kind of what you get up there. You kind of roll the dice. Anytime you head out there, you might get, you know, phenomenal weather. You might get crummy weather, something in between. But I can tell you though, the people that flew in uh, the day after we came out, they got a week of beautiful weather. You could see every mountain peak for as far as the eye could see so man i was i was excited for those guys because I, I knew they were fine and go we hit it perfect <laughs> yeah jeez uh, so was there anything whether it was from that hunt or some other experience in the in the past year of hunting that stands out to you as a, a learning opportunity or something the an area that you're still growing in as a hunter man i tell you what i mean just just that you know that that kind of mountain hunting isn't something I've done a ton of, you know, but, um, I, you know, I guess one thing that stands out to me is, you know, I mean, it, it can be, you know, unforgiving, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, Alaska and those mountains, man, they don't, they don't care if you're tired. They don't care if you're wet, you know, don't care if you're cold. Um, like I said, it can give you beautiful weather, but it might not, you know, and, and definitely come prepared, you know, come with some, contingency plans um you know if you are flying into a lake you know ditch some dry bags with some extra clothes at the lake you know like kind of you know you can't take you know maybe as much gear as you'd like you know because you are going to have you know weight constraints you're depending on what plane you're going in on but um you know i I definitely would you know plan as much as you had and uh, plan as much ahead as you can and have some contingency plans and some safeties built in because you know, you might, you might end up needing them. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's cool to hear so about. That's what, that's, you know, that's what, that's what we did. You know I mean? We ditched, you know, some extra food in some dry bags and some extra, um, some extra clothes, you know, which I ended up using actually the day we came out, like it was nasty, wet, you know, we worked hard coming out. Um, and you know, I needed some, you know, dry clothes to warm up when we got down there, we got a fire going and stuff like that, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, all, all the stuff, I guess, to, to live in the back. I mean, you guys have done that a lot. Heck, you've probably done it more than I have, you know. But um, just, you know, have those essentials that you can stay safe out there, you know. Right. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, that's cool to hear. Let's transition to talking about um, scope selection. Obviously, a big topic, something you could, you know, approach from many different angles. There's a lot of opinions, a lot of positions out there. But just to give, um, you know, listeners context for what we're doing with this series, um, you know, we're, we're talking about building a backcountry rifle. And by that, we don't necessarily mean um, like the lightest option out there, but weight's always a consideration for us, especially um, in this build that Steve and I are doing. And when it comes to scopes, I mean, it's not necessarily always the first place to start, but as, as we were shopping, it was like one of the first things I was looking at simply because... Um, scopes can get freaking heavy. I mean, you know, real heavy. Yep. So, you know, just to jump ahead, you know, Steve and I both um, kind of decided to go with the Razer HD um, LH, which uh, stands for Light Hunter. So a good lighter weight option that still has the features that we need from the scope. But just in general, what are some of the some of the sacrifices you make when pursuing a lighter weight scope versus something um, that's a bit more heavier and feature rich? Is it just, you know, additional add-ons and capabilities? Um, is it construction? Like what, what separates a lighter weight scope from some of these behemoths that we see out there? 
You know, I'd say, yeah, you know, you're going to have some features and, and really it's going to come down to, um, of course, these are all going to be generalities, right? But so you're going to have features um, as well as like the application, right? So um, if you're building a lightweight mountain rifle, your needs are going to be much different than a person who's building, you know, a bench rest precision rifle or, or, uh, you know, a long range, um, precision rifle for like the PRS series. You're just, you're not carrying those rifles like you are, you know, a mountain rifle, you know? So, um, that said, you are going to need, you know, there's gonna be some common threads. You're going to need, you're going to need excellent optics. You're going to need a scope that tracks true, um, with a forgiving eye box. That's going to have, you know, um, clear, you know, ultra clear, you know, high resolution, um, accurate color for the light. I mean, those are all things that, you know, common things that you're definitely going to want, right? Those are, you know, positive attributes that you're going to need when you're on the mountain or, you know, shooting paper or whatever. You, you definitely want those things, but, um, and it could end up that, you know, depending on the country that you're in, you, you potentially might want to dial your elevation for a longer shot. If you get in a scenario where, um, you're just not going to get any closer, you know, I mean, I've definitely been in, the, in those spots, you know, hunting out West where you get in a glass of a buck, it's across a Canyon. Like if you get to the other side, you're, you're not going to be able to see that deer, you know, for, mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So, and you're either going to take the shot or you're not right. So it's nice to have those longer range, uh, capabilities where you can either hold off your reticle if you know, you know, if you know your ballistic data and have good dope or, or dial your elevation. So, um, and it's just going to come down to how the scope was designed, you know, what materials are used, you know, um, oftentimes like, you know, when you get into the the mountain game, you know, the lighter, the weight, the more it's going to cost, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. not always, but you know, um, and so, I guess it really comes down to the application and then, and then building a scope, you know, for that application. Right. Um, and some scopes, you know, kind of bridge that middle ground too, between kind of the long range side, um, and, and the lightweight side, you know, I can like our Viper, um, HSLR four to 16 by 50, right. It's not a monster of a scope, but it does have an exposed elevation turret, um, fairly streamlined fits on, on, uh, you know, kind of your standard hunting rifle very well. I've hunted that scope quite a bit, you know? And so that would be a scope where you're like, Hey, you know, I don't want, I'm not shooting crazy long range, but I want to have the ability to dial my elevation quickly. And I think there's, you know, a solid chance that I'm going to have, you know, that that, that I'm going to be need to do that. You know, um, that said though, you know, you get into a scope, like we're talking about the ones you guys selected with that razor HDLH, Excellent optics, super lightweight. Um, they track super true. Now it doesn't have an exposed turret, but that doesn't mean that you can't dial it. So if you got good dope for you know the cartridge that you're pushing through your rifle, and you got into a situation where you're like, holy mackerel, you know, like I've got a buck, he's at you know six fifty. Um, I really want to be. A, I've got the time. You know, that's another thing, right? I, mm. He's relaxed. He's on that hillside. I've got the time. I've got good data. Just un- you can unscrew that cap. The scope has a zero reset feature on the turret, right? So once you get your scope zeroed at the range, you can re-index that turret so your zero is lined up at a zero mark. So you have a, a solid reference there. You don't have to remember, oh, you know, it was at such and such, you know, mark. It's like, nope, your zero is on your zero reference. And you can dial that shot. So let's say at that range, let's say you had to dial... 10 MOA or 10.5 MOA. I mean, you could dial that, get back down on the gun and hold dead on with your crosshair and know that, you know, you're going to execute that shot and that bolt's going to, you know, go where it needs to go. You could do the same thing with your reticle though, in that scope where, um, and there's actually, there's two reticles available. Um, you know, there's the, uh, um, the G4, BDC, which is more of a a BDC reticle. So those hash marks in that reticle are are going to be, um, 
they're going to subtend, you know, around a general ballistics curve, right? So that's designed to kind of give you a, uh, it's designed to get you in the kill zone. And now if you go into the trouble of getting all those numbers that we talked about before for dialing your shot, you can definitely plug those in and figure out exactly where your BDCs are on. So maybe your 300 yard hash mark is actually, you know, dead on at 325. We'll say something like that. Um, now the HSR four reticle that's available in that scope, that's just an MOA based scope or a reticle. So, um, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, you got your, your ballistic data and it says, you know, like I said, at, at 600 yards, I need to dial or hold 10 MOA, 10 MOA. You can do that on the reticle. Like you just hold 10 MOA and let it rip. And, you know, it's going to do the same thing as, as, as if you had dialed that elevation on the turret. So people have their preference. Uh, one is not necessarily better than the other. Um, there's advantages to both, um, and uh, but both are extremely effective. Yeah. What you, mean, what rest, it, what, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned you, uh, tracking. I'm a complete rifle scope newbie. So what did you mean by the, the scope tracks really well? So, you know, any rifle scope that you have, and that's one thing we focus on really hard is we want it to track true, right? So um, when you... Uh, depending on what style scope you have, but let's say, you know, we're, we're t still talking about the Razor HDLHs here. Um, you know, you unscrew the turret cap, which kind of, you know, protects the, uh, you know, the, the turret that's underneath it. Mm. So when you make those adjustments, right? So that scope clicks in quarter minute of angle. So you want that scope to be clicking in exactly, you know, a quarter minute of angle, right? Okay. So, A, that helps you sight the scope in accurately, right? Like, you know, when you're, uh, it, you know, when you're telling it to make that adjustment, it is making that adjustment very mm -hmm. precisely, right? Mm -hmm. And that also comes into play, you know, when you are, or if you are dialing that long range shot, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, dialing 10, or if your dope charts telling you to dial 10 MOA, your scope better be dialing 10 MOA or that bullet's not going to end up where you want it. Right. Right. So, um, so that's what we mean by, you know, um, you know, accurate or precise or, or, you know, true tracking of those turrets. Um, okay. and I'll, I'll throw this out there cause this is, this is kind of, this kind of goes into, uh, tracking and, um, problems guys can run into is you want to make sure that you mount that rifle scope properly. And he, he, tighter is not necessarily better, right? So you want to follow the instructions, and I'd say follow the instructions on the scope manufacturer's website. Uh, but we recommend, like on, on the rings themselves, about 15 inch pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but is more than sufficient to hold that scope in place. If you over torque your rings, right? you're going to flex that outer tube, right? You know, the, the, you know, so whether you have a, a one inch tube or a 30 millimeter tube, you, you can flex that aluminum tube, which will impede the internal erector tube, right? So what, and that's, what's actually moving up and down when you're or up and down and left and right, when you're adjusting your turrets, depending on it, if you're adjusting your elevation turret or your one inch turret, right? That needs to be able to move properly. And if you over torque those rings, you will impede that internal erector tube. And so you might, uh, you might think, oh, the, the scope's off or it doesn't track or, you know, I make an adjustment and then two shots later, uh, it's overcorrected. And there's, you know, there's an issue with the scope, which I guess, you know, in some ways there is, right? right. But it's because it, it's, a, it's a ring base, you know, mounting issue somewhere in there, right? Um, so you want to make sure, like I said, that, that, that's a big thing. And, you know, I mean, even me before I worked here, you know, I mean, I'm on lots of rifle scopes and I'm trying to think, you know, I'm like, well, let's see, did I think that scope was messed up or, or did I think that I just didn't have an accurate rifle, you know, cause you're getting kind of wild groupings when you're trying to make an adjustment and all of a sudden you're, you know, two inches high and okay, now I made an adjustment. Oh, it seems to be settled in. And then all of a sudden, Whoa, I've got a flyer, man, this thing doesn't shoot. Well, might've just been over torqued rings. 
We want to take a moment to thank our friends at First Light for making the Hunt Backcountry podcast possible. First Light's clothing will enable you to go farther and stay longer in the backcountry. One of the key pieces for me and my First Light system is the Uncompagre Puffy. I use this versatile piece all the way from early archery seasons to the late season. It's a great piece to have with you as insurance for when the weather turns, or of course as the temperature drops in the late season, it is a critical piece of insulation. Unlike some other insulation pieces that I've tried, the Uncompagre is extremely durable and also water resistant thanks to a DWR coating. It's not going to replace rain gear, but it does a great job at shedding unexpected water. And speaking of it, First Light's 37.5 insulation, which is a synthetic insulation, will stand up to moisture much better than down pieces. All in all, it's just a great versatile piece. Check it out if you need some insulation headed into this next season. So let's, um, there's so many aspects of, of scope selection that I want to get into, but we kind of opened the reticle discussion, um, and I'd love to touch a bit more on that, circle back to that, um, discuss some differences. Um, again, I'm, we can keep this in the context of the Razer HDLH because that's what, you know, we're using, but it, this obviously applies to not only different scopes in the Vortex line, but just across the board as we talk reticles. So going back to um, BDC, a bullet drop compensator, something that Vortex offers, again, as, as well as other brands versus um, like an MOA, um, one of the advantages uh, with the MOA would be using that as well for range estimation. Is that accurate? So, yeah, y- yep, you can do that, yep. So is that a, so, is that a big deciding factor that you see a lot of guys make um, using one or the other, or do, do you know now with the you know proficiency of laser rangefinders, is that not so much a factor for what you're seeing hunters make their decision on? You know, I mean, I'd say it it can be handy. Um, it's a good skill to have. You know, um, it's a nice backup. Um, it's not going to be as precise. You know, as as a laser laser rangefinder, it's not going to be as fast as a laser rangefinder. Um, I'd say on the on the hunting side of things, I wouldn't say the uh, range estimation is um, you know a crazy deciding factor. Um, to me, what you gain with a with an MOA based you know like a straight MOA based reticle or or mill based reticle, depending on um, you know your rifle scope selection. But um, it, it's the precision. It's the it's the ability to hold off your reticle um, and be very precise. And like I said, all this kind of hinges on if you've got good ballistic data. Otherwise, you know, you might as well just hold off the center crosshair, you know, or or hold for hair, you know, or or know that you know, heck, you know, at you know, three hundred yards and then, you know, if I if I hold the back line, it's going to drop in there somewhere. But you know, if, if you go through the the process of, of getting good ballistic data and validating that data. Um, you know, that's, that's another big thing. You need to go to the range, um, you know, get, get numbers off the box and, you know, ballistic coefficients, um, you know, from a website, um, that stuff is great for generating what I call like an initial drop chart, right? That's going to get you in the ballpark, but you might find when you go to the range and you shoot, you know, and, and you want to validate that, that initial data at, at really the furthest range you can shoot, right? Or not the furthest range you can shoot, but, you know, um, the further you can uh, confidently shoot, the better, right? Because um, any variances are going to be exaggerated, you know, at, at extended ranges. So we have a range here, and I generally validate my data at um, about 550 yards, right? Like I'm confident shooting at that distance. I can keep a tight group at that distance, but it's far enough out that if there's um, a discrepancy in what my dope chart is telling me and what's actually happening, then I can go back in and say, you know what? Yeah, I got this initial drop chart, but at 550 yards, instead of being dead on with what it was telling me, I'm actually two MOA low. And so I can go back in and account for that. And then now I've got a drop chart that is very usable 
and they're going to be uh, very accurate, uh, you know, when shooting at extended ranges. Yeah. I mean, it goes without saying, too, that the precision um, and the accuracy of that MOA-based reticle versus the BDC is going to be probably more appealing to someone who's interested in the longer-range shooting, correct? Certainly, certainly. You know, um, and if, if, you're, if you're a person that you're like, you know what, I'm not into that, I'm not going to take the time to do that, then boom, that's where that BDC comes into play. That's going to get you in the ballpark. That's going to be, uh, get you, you know, generally in the kill zone, you know, um, and, uh, you know, for kind of, I'd say those, that's 600 and in, you know, um, which is still, you know, I mean, that's, those are long <laughs> shots, right? You know, yeah. but again, what you're going to want to do with that though, you definitely want to take that to the range because, you know, all rifles are different, different cartridges, different velocities. There's so much going on there that you're going to want to take that to the range and hopefully validate your BDCs and find out where you're hitting at those respective distances. Um, and now on both those reticles, I'll also mention, and actually this is, this is a problem that, you know, some guys, you know, run into. Um, you're going to want to make sure that... Um, you have the reticle or the magnification uh, on its maximum power for those scopes, right? Because those, whether it's the BDC hash marks or the MOA hash marks, this, this goes, I mean, this is just across the board. This is any rifle scope in a second focal plane optical system. And that's going to be, uh, you know, like these Razor HD LH rifle scopes. That's a second focal plane optical system. So when you go up in magnification or down in magnification, the reticle stays the same, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't appear to grow or shrink. It always looks the same, right? So those hash marks to be usable are only going to be accurate if you have the scope on its maximum magnification. So um, if you try to use those hash marks and you're, you know, let's say you have the 2 to 10 and you're on 8 power, they're no longer accurate. So you want, you're going to want to make sure, and that's something you need to be conscious of, is to, to have that magnification maxed out. I'd say that's pretty, I'd say m- m- the vast majority of second focal plane rifle scopes that have a BDC or an MOA or mill-based reticle, they're going to be accurate at the maximum uh, magnification on that optic. Not always though. And there's a couple caveats to that, even within the vortex lineup. Right. And the reason for that is, you know, if you have a scope that let's say it's, uh, I'll just throw it out there, uh, a five to 20. Right. And actually this is a good example. Um, our, our Viper, uh, six and a half to 20 by 50 rifle scope has a mill dot reticle, right? Well, those, those dots aren't accurate, aren't going to be accurate at the maximum. I think, I want to say it's 14 or 18. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to look at, I haven't used that scope in a while. I should know that. I'm going to have to look that up when we get done. <laughs> but you may not always want to be maxed out, right? right? Because there could be atmospheric conditions that are coming into play here. Maybe it's really mm-hmm. hot out. You know, maybe there's a bunch of mirage. And so at 20 power, Maybe I'm having a hard time seeing what I'm trying to shoot at. So I want to back that magnification off. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's where it can be handy. And that, you know, and that's in a higher magnification scope, I'd say that's also where a first focal plane reticle or optical system, you know, comes into play as well, because um, in that optical system, the uh, the hash marks are going to, or your reticle itself will appear to grow or shrink in direct proportion to your magnification, right? So as you go up in magnification, the reticle will, will appear to get bigger. As you go down in magnification, the reticle will, will appear to get smaller. Now, what that gives you, though, is the, uh, the ability to use those hash marks at any point in the zoom range. Um, like I said, more critical in a high magnification scope doesn't really make sense in a scope that's a, a, a one and a half to eight or a two to 10 or a three to 15, uh, like the ones you guys are going to be running, <clears throat> because if you're going to be making a longer range shot, 
odds are you're going to want to have that sucker maxed out anyway, right? Mm-hmm. And also with that, you know, take that two to ten, for instance, that reticle is going to be tiny at two if it was a first focal plane system. I mean, to the point where you're not going to be able to use any of the data that's there. So different things make sense for for different different rifle scopes, but um, I kind of I definitely kind of rabbit trailed there, um, kind of get, get me going mm-hmm. on this stuff, and then I just. No, that's go good. All I mean, over the place. Yeah. that's but, good, and the, and those are the types of things you know where typically you know your first focal plane, which gives you that uh, advantage if you need it, I guess, of the reticle shrinking and growing with your magnification. Those are, the, I think, good examples of you know you mentioned it's obviously more relevant at the higher zoom ranges. Those are typically where you're getting yep. into those bigger, heavier scopes that kind of don't apply for our use case. And that's a good example of some of the things that in a lighter streamlined package, you don't have that. But as you mentioned, it's not necessary for most of the shots that we would be taking. Um, you know, and as you mentioned too, if, you know, I know for like, I chose the two to 10, for example, if I'm going to need to be using uh, BDC or MOA based calculations, I'm probably going to be up at that 10. Like that's, that, that's the time that you, you know, you need the magnification and therefore you need to do some sort of compensation for that, you know, that longer distance shot. It, if I'm at three or four exactly. and can make the shot at that closer range, you know, it doesn't matter that it's not relevant to BDC. I'm not using it. No, exactly. You're just holding, mm-hmm. you know, center crosshair and, and letting it rip, you know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're spot on there for sure. <laughs> yeah. For me, I mean, it, and again, this just goes to highlight so much of this is preference, but I, I chose to go with the BDC for several reasons, but one of them is just because it's so much, for me and my eye and the way I process things, it's so much cleaner just to look at. Like I can feel that I can hold on target um, and hopefully I'm making as short of a shot as possible. I'm, you know, I'm not going into this to be a long range hunter. I want capabilities of uh, making a shot I have to, but for me, the whole purpose of hunting is to get close, right? And so I want to be as close yep. as I can. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to be in positions where I don't have to do a ton of calculation. Um, I like having a BDC and I want to know what I can do with it. But for me, it's just yep. so much cleaner to look at that reticle um, and hold on with that center dot versus having all these MOA hash marks everywhere. Yeah, for sure. You know, and that's one thing I, I love that BDC reticle. Um, and I, and, you know, you touched on that center dot, that, that, uh, that target dot, man, I tell you what, I, there's something about that. And, and I mean, I shoot all sorts of reticles, but, um, man, there's just kind of an interesting confidence level when you just pin that dot right where you want it. You know what I mean? It just, there, there's something about it that I agree. Like I find it super appealing, man. You pin that dot, give it, give it a good squeeze and you know, something's, you know, probably gonna, probably gonna fall down. You know, and you talk about also shooting long, you know, the longer ranges, um, like we're talking about that, that blacktail hunt, you know, that, that I was on in August, you know, I was running the one and a half to eight by 32, right? I was trying to have the lightest rifle possible. Um, I think I was running a, a Kimber Montana 308, you know, with that Razor HDLH one and a half to eight by 32, super sleek trim scope, lightweight, um, you know, that thing's coming in at 13.4 ounces. But prior to the hunt, you know, I did go through the process of getting my ballistic data if I needed it. Um, and like I said, we were shooting at that 550 mark. And dude, I was running steel in the pocket at 550 with a, with a one and a half to eight. You know, and I think that's, and, and I get caught up in it myself as well, thinking, oh, more is better. I need more magnification. I'm going to shoot long range, you know. And just going through that process with that scope, just because I've been shooting a lot of higher magnification scopes lately, you know, made me reevaluate, well, hey, what, what do I need for what I'm going to be doing, you know, for the applications and the scenarios that I'm going to be in? Um, you know, I've, I've hunted out west a, a fair amount, right? And, and the longest shot I've ever taken on an animal was 560, which is definitely a poke, right? At least that's a poke for me, you know, not for everybody. But, um, and, you know, after doing that with the one and a half, I'm like, heck, I could have taken that shot with the, you know, an eight power scope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, what, it, uh, changing subjects, magnification, certainly something we wanted to discuss, but what do you feel is sort of that sweet spot for, 
um, you know, general big game hunting, obviously, you know, you get into something like a guy's building uh, a, a gun just for, you know, varmints or just for predator hunting or just for antelope. Like, you know, you might want the higher magnification there, but if you're kind of looking more of a do it all, more of a back country, which is kind of what we're after, say, you know, again, I, our, our intention is not to be long range hunters, um, but to mm-hmm. be as effective as possible. You know, if you got a guy whose max um, is between four and six hundred yards, say, I mean, what do you feel is like a suitable high end um, magnification range for that range? If your max max is definitely not beyond six and more likely closer to like four or five man i'd say um you know i'd take a hard look at um you know a two to ten a three to fifteen you know in a four exuberant scope you know a four to sixteen you're just able to do so much with those rifle scopes you know for for a person that might find themselves you know uh you know, in a tree in November and then coos deer hunting in, in December, um, man, that, that three to 15, four to 16, that's going to be tough to beat, you know, but like I said, you know, uh, that, that two to 10, like, like you chose, I, I think there's going to be a few scenarios where you're not going to be able to do what, what you want to do and, and effectively execute a shot, you know, um, like I said, you you can shoot pretty dang long range with those. I mean, heck, I've even I've shot a thousand yards with a four to sixteen. You know, it worked pretty dang good. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, man, a, a two to ten, a three to fifteen, a four to sixteen. Um, like I said, you you can you know from from twenty yards to six hundred yards. You know, you're gonna be pretty dang good to go. Yeah. Okay. Good to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. as you mentioned earlier, a lot of us get caught into bigger's better, right? And so, you know, I think it's just our yep. capabilities yep. as guys a lot of times to be like, let's get the the biggest, the fastest, whatever, and we always assume that's the best. But sometimes it's overkill for what you need, really. Well, it's it's overkill. You know, you're, then you're getting into you know, like you're talking about backcountry stuff. It's going to be a heavier scope. Um, you know, and if you're in a in a in a even on uh, even on a single hunt, right? You can be in, uh, get into a bunch of different uh, terrain scenarios, or maybe you're going from the timber. Uh, you know, you're hunting dark timber, and then boom, you get into an opening or a clear cut or a burn or something like that. And now you've got you know way more extended ranges that you're going to be shooting, right? those two to tens and three to 15 and four to 16 are going to give you that versatility to, to crank that magnification down to its low end. So you're going to, you're going to increase the exit pupil, which is going to give you, you know, more lights going to reach your eye, you know, in those, those darker timber scenarios, you're going to be able to uh, acquire a target faster because you're going to have a bigger field of view, you know, on, on the low end of those magnifications. Um, so when you get into some of those, you know, bigger scopes and that more is better mentality that can that can cripple you at the same time you know depending on the scenario that you're in right Mm. you mentioned two things there i wanted to cover and that was uh you know exit pupil and how that how that really plays into things obviously critical to hunting scenarios um you know as we're uh, many times encountering game at first light and last light so i'd love to cover that um and then also you mentioned field of view obviously again important in hunting of how much you know area can you see as you're looking through the scope and hopefully not having tunnel vision both of those um i think sometimes get misunderstood so if you could kind of explain them a little bit further and the question you know i have is it's not always necessarily true that the same scope at say 10 power is going to have the same field of view correct and why is that Oh boy, you know what? Now you're getting into the, <laughs> the optical design, and I'll probably want to have one of the engineers jump on the phone with you. And, and there's definitely other people here that could probably explain it better yeah. than I mean. Than we, I can. we don't need to so, get into uh, the weeds, but is it a matter of like a 10 power scope with uh you know a one inch tube versus a 10 power with a 30 millimeter? I mean, what? Because I see you know just in my own shopping of some fairly drastic differences, at least what I've seen in listed specs in terms of field of view, yet the scopes have identical or very similar, you know, magnification ranges. Yep. Yep. You know, and I think there's definitely going to be some, some, I guess, you know, 
some rules in there, I guess, for back of, lack of a better term. Um, I would say, you know, going back to exit people, right? <clears throat> like, uh, like, I guess I'll take a, a binocular for an example, but um, let's say you have a, a, a 10 power binocular. Let's say it's a 10 by 50, right? So that's going to mean it's got 10x magnification and the uh, objective diameter is 50 millimeters and that's going to be the the actual lens right it's going to be 50 millimeters so exit pupil is essentially you take that objective diameter and divide it by the magnification so like i said you got a 50 millimeter objective diameter excuse me divide that by 10 boom you've got a five five millimeter exit pupil so um, wherein let, let's say you had a, you know, we'll say, we'll just use easy math, but we'll say you had a, a, a 10 by, uh, 40 binocular, right? Well, then you're going to be down in there like, you know, four millimeter exit people. So, and that, that exit people number kind of, uh, denotes like how much of that light is going to be reaching your eye right now. That's all things being equal though, because other things that come, into play, you know, light transmission, optical design itself, right? You know, how, how well was the optic design, uh, the quality of the glass, uh, the quality of the anti-reflective coatings, you know, applied to, uh, applied to that glass. Right. So, um, just a lot of things come into play, um, as far as, you know, light transmission, um, you know, I guess, you know, comparatively, you know, if you took, um, you know, I guess our entry point into the roof prism bino lineup, you know, you might have two optics that are 10 by 50s, but, you know, our top of the line bino, it, it's going to outperform, you know, just because it's got, you know, it does have better materials. It does have, uh, you know, better glass, better co- coatings, uh, it, you know, the, everything put together in that optic is going to make it a better binocular. So it's going to be, you know, which, which is why it costs more. Right. Um, mm. so it's kind of one of those things you, you can have two 10 by fifties and I guess essentially they're both going to have the same exit people. Right. But depending on the materials used and how they're put together is going to also dictate, you know, how it performs in the field as well. Yeah. So you mentioned that. that. Okay, yeah. I explain that okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you mentioned the exit pupil being um, the result of the the objective diameter. So basically, the you know the bare end, the big end of the scope, that diameter and that lens, as well as the magnification mm-hmm. level. So unlike the binocular, obviously the exit pupil on a rifle scope, assuming it's not a fixed magnification level, can be changed. Meaning, yep. if you have that ten by fifty but you have the magnification set at two, you're obviously going to have a much greater exit pupil um, than you would if you were at 10 power, correct? Correct. Yep. You know, and that's definitely something to remember too. You know, if you, uh, you know, when you start getting in those lower light scenarios, you may want to back that magnification off a little bit, you know? Um, Cause you're effectively getting more light to, to the eye. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So, uh, Another aspect um, of this discussion, again, a, a topic I think we could get off into the weeds too. <laughs> that's not that's not my hope, but I want to discuss it and hopefully clarify a few things. Um, is parallax what what that is, um, and then how how it's necessary, and then specifically within you know the line that we're talking about today, for example, you know with the Razer HD LH, the three to fifteen has a parallax adjustment the two um, smaller um, models do not. Is that because parallax is only, um, you know, adjustable parallax is essentially only more important at those higher magnification ranges, Um, you know, say beyond that 10x? So kind of talk us through kind of what parallax is and then how it's, um, you know, relevant to us as hunters and that whole piece of the puzzle. So, yeah, so so by and large, you know, and not a hard and fast rule, but you probably won't see, you know, a, a parallax adjustment, you know, um, until you, you know, 
exceed that that top end of 10x magnification. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. It's it's less critical at at uh, I guess you know I'd say the closer ranges, right? Um, and it's just going to be you're not going to have to contend with the issues where it may affect, you know, the outcome, um, of the shot, right. When you start getting in, you know, in a higher magnification scope, shooting greater distances, you're definitely going to want to account for that parallax. Um, and, or people call it a, a parallax or, or a focus or a side focus, uh, depending on if that parallax adjustment, sometimes it'll be on the bell of a rifle scope, or sometimes it will be, um, you know, on the left side of the turret housing. So it just depends on, you know, how that scope is constructed. Um, I would say, so it does a couple things, you know, like I said, people call it a focus. Um, and a good example, I guess I, I could, uh, bring up would be as far as to better understand, I guess, the, the, what parallax is or, or how it's affecting things would be if you and I are driving in a car, right? And I know I've got the speedometer pegged at 60 miles an hour. Like I'm sitting right behind, you know, right behind the speedometer, right? But you might think, oh man, no, you're just, why are you going so slow? You're going 55, you know, you know, gas it up a little bit. Let's get there. Well, the person who's riding shotgun is essentially experiencing, you know, the negative effects of parallax, right? Where the lenses, where you're not perfectly behind the lenses and everything's, you know, aligned in such a fashion where um, you're seeing things accurately, right? So that adjustment on the scope is essentially accounting for that, right? Um, If you're perfectly aligned behind the scope, you're not going to, uh, it's not going to necessarily be an issue, right? But let's say maybe you're shooting from an awkward position or it's a high angle shot and you've got your, your, your rifle on your pack and, you know, things aren't perfect, but the crosshair is where it needs to be and you're going to let it rip, right? Well, you're going to, if it's a longer range shot, you know, you're going to want to have to adjust that parallax to account for any, you know, variance where you may not be uh, perfectly, you know, in line with, uh, with the rifle scope and the reticle and, you know, to execute that shot. So hopefully that makes sense. There's other guys that can probably explain it better than I can, but that's, that's probably the, the best way that I would do it. Yeah, no, that's a good summary. I mean, it's essentially, as you mentioned, it's, if you're not perfectly square, perfectly in line, um, what you're seeing, you know, the crosshair centered on, isn't necessarily centered on that spot just because of the angle that you're seeing things from. And then parallax can help account for that, uh, you know, imperfection essentially. Yep. 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 That, that, that adjustment. Yep. So you're essentially, you're, yeah, you're adjusting for, you know, any, you know, discrepancy. Yeah. Like you said, of, of being in perfect alignment there. How do you, how do you do the adjustment? Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, like I said, I'd say most of our rifle scopes, like the three to 15, that Steve has, it's on the left side of, of the housing there. Um, it, it'll be, you know, marked in, you know, um, you know, I think, you know, hundred yard increments. And essentially if you were taking, let's say, we'll, we'll say a 300 yard shot, you know, you'd probably want to move that parallax, uh, adjustment to somewhere around the 300 yard mark. Now that's another thing. It'll be a little bit different for each individual, you know, but, um, as long as you're kind of around in that ballpark of that 300 yard mark and everything comes into sharp focus for you, that's where you're going to want to be. So just because it's not right at that mark, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, so you're essentially just dial, you're dialing it close to that 300 yard mark and just going back and forth to see what focus is the best. No different than focusing a binocular or spine scope. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know, so now I did, I did have, uh, I encountered one gentleman who was, who, uh, was using his parallax adjustment incorrectly. He thought he was actually adjusting the turret and it obviously worked out. Okay. Cause he said, uh, 
man, I don't know how you guys do it, but man, I just, I adjust that and stuff falls down. I was like, well, <laughs> I'm glad everything fell down. <laughs> Get away with so, one there. That is not adjusting your elevation, but yeah. it worked out. So that's a positive thing, right? Yeah, definitely got away with some there. <laughs> So we're, we're coming up on time. If we could just kind of conclude this discussion, which I think has been super helpful with uh, two kind of interrelated things. Um, one is field of view. And then if we could, I know you kind of mentioned it with the torque um, on the rings, but just any other mounting tips um, for a scope. And obviously part of mounting um, and field of view and your head position, all that's interrelated. So first, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about field of view and then maybe talk about any other tips or tricks that you have in terms of mounting a scope properly. And again, I know that's a big discussion in general, but just some of the key points there that we could conclude with would be great. So, yeah, so, I mean, I'd say, you know, field of view is definitely something, you know, you're going to want to take a look at. I wouldn't get too crazy hung up on it, you know, but um, it's definitely important. It definitely I'm, comes Mark, into play. Hey, Mark, I, that's totally my bad. I said field of view. I meant eye relief. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no worries. That was worries. totally on me. I'm um, like, wait a second. He said field of view. Oh, wait, I said field of view. But yeah, I'm in eye relief and mounting because obviously those come into uh, come into play together. So, yeah, so um, eye relief is definitely important for, for a couple of reasons. Um, you're going to want to have a scope that um, has, you know, I guess what I call a forgiving eye box, right, um, where it's not hard to get behind, you know, um, some scopes, you know, man, you can experience, you know, extreme vignetting if you're not like just perfectly behind that scope, right? So you're going to want to have a scope that's designed, um, with, like I said, a forgiving eye box, um, and with enough eye relief that, um, you're not getting scoped, you know, you're not getting cut by that rifle scope every time you pull the trigger. So, um, you know, generally I find, we find, you know, um, around the four inch mark is optimal, you know? Um, just because it's going to allow for proper mounting, um, your head placement on the rifle stock is, you know, everything kind of comes into like a nice, uh, it meshes nicely about that, you know, about that four inch mark. Um, it's plenty of room that, you know, the recoil of the rifle, um, you know, the scope's not going to bite you, um, which can be problematic because it hurts and it just sucks. So definitely want to try and avoid that. Um, you know, uh, and then, you know, you talk, get back into mounting scopes. I'd say, um, one of the best tools you can have is an inch pounds torque wrench. You know, if you don't have one, get one, it's going to come in handy. You, you, it'll probably be worth its weight in gold. Like I said, uh, you'll avoid frustration at the range from over tightening your rings and trying to, you know, troubleshoot and chase stuff. That's, you know, not there it's just you know indicative of if you've if uh, that you've over torqued those rings um and i'd say that that's one thing to really look out not that it can't be the scope right i'm not going to sit here and say that that if, if you're having an issue it, it's not but i'd say by and large and i'm talking in probably you know you know if you want to talk per percentiles you know in the 90s um if you've got an issue going on where you think something's wrong and you can't figure it out and it's being difficult to troubleshoot and you're having inconsistencies and, and you know that rifle shot before, or you know it likes that load. Um, man, rings, bases, and, and mounting are, are the three things to, to really at least initially, you know, take a hard look at, you know, and, and uh, it, it can just be, I mean, those are the things that connect that, scope to the rifle. I mean, you've got two very generally expensive and, you know, um, highly, you know, a rifle scope is, is, is a precision optical and mechanical instrument, you know, um, you know, but also the reason why rifle scopes have turrets, it's to, uh, make up for, uh, inconsistencies and potentially the rifle or, or the mount, right? Otherwise you wouldn't need turrets on it. So, um, check those rings bases now. I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. You know, if mm. it's particularly if you're experiencing, you know, an issue where you're trying to troubleshoot it and can't, can't figure something out. 
any other any other uh, things you want to conclude with? I mean, you know, as it as it comes to vortex, you know, to be honest, I I looked at a bunch of different scopes. Um, you know, I had actually I've used different vortex scopes for uh, different rifles in the past. Um, I always loved the uh, razor. A buddy of mine has a razor on a three gun, and just you know, obviously much different um, than what we're doing with this build. But I was just blown away by that glass when I'd seen it in the past, but knew that the weight of the, the standard razor line isn't something that I wanted to tote around for this build. I mean, and to be honest with you, right. I was unaware of uh, the the Razor Light Hunter line until I started, you know, really digging in and doing some comparison shopping and definitely excited. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, and just, you know, I'm continuously blown away by Vortex's, you know, warranty and customer service and things like that. Anything else you want to just kind of highlight on the Vortex line or the Razor uh, Light Hunter line specifically? You know, I, you know, I mean, and going back to, you know, with, with those Light Hunters, you know, I mean, what you guys are doing with them is the ideal application. You know, a lightweight, highly functional you know, top tier sporting rifle, you know, for, for, and, and those things are going to cover, boy, really any application, you know, that, that you're going to throw at it, you know, um, you know, and then you touched on the warranty and, you know, we, I always say we, we try to build our stuff. So a person never needs to use the warranty, but you know, things do happen. I mean, as you know, as well as I do, man, you know, the, the, uh, scenarios and, uh, environments and and activities that we put our hunting equipment through are not generally the friendliest, and so you know things do happen. And and if you're a Vortex customer, um, we're going to take care of you. And, and that you know that that goes before the sale and after the sale. So I mean, our warranty truly is a lifetime, unconditional, no fault warranty. Um, all repair work is done here in house. So uh, you know if you do have an issue. Um, we got pretty darn speedy turnaround time. I'd say generally once we receive the optic, you know, two weeks or less. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that we focus on, you know, and in a lot of ways, you know, hunting, you know, when are you going to have something go down? Well, potentially something's going to happen during hunting season when you need your equipment. So we definitely want it back in your hands as soon as possible. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, listeners, definitely go ahead and check out uh, the Vortex Optics website. You know, if you're kind of shopping, it's it's super helpful. All the specs of, you know, their variety of models listed and then some awesome tools as well. Something that I meant to cover we didn't really get into. So just to mention it is you guys have um, a very helpful um, long range ballistics calculator. So when I was looking, for example, at the loads that I'm going to be shooting um, in this build and then comparing that to the BDC um, for the Light Hunter that I chose, you know, I can see, okay, in general, the, you know, the BDC says this is a 200 or 300 hash mark, but according to the data for this load, which obviously I'm going to verify in the field, it's actually showing, you know, 287 for my 300 hash mark and things like that but it's a great jumping off point um, with that ballistics calculator that you guys have on the site um, obviously many of our listeners are familiar with vortex hopefully found you guys on social media but anywhere else that you would point listeners to mark beyond the website man i'd say the website i'd say um you know give us a call you know we definitely love hearing from our customers we want to talk to you guys if you have a question or uh, or a concern or trying to sort something out what might be the best choice man give us a call we've got you know a team of guys here um you know that you know and a, i'd say a diverse team from uh you know tactical long range shooters uh competition shooters uh you know people like myself that are passionate about you know western mountain hunting archery um we definitely have a you know a team of you know i'd, I'd say experts here and, and uh we definitely want you to have the best optic to suit your needs. So give us a call or, or like you said, reach out on one of the social media platforms. We, we're very active on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, so yeah, just give us a shout. We'll, uh, we'll get back to you and, and definitely, uh, you know, and, and, and want to talk to you. So awesome. Well, thanks so much right. for joining us today, Mark. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mark. No, thanks for, thanks for having me on guys. No, it's uh, definitely my pleasure and and uh yeah it's always boy i tell you what you know give me a chance to talk about you know 
hunting or shooting or optics and you know i'll, I'll bend here for as long as i can so <laughs> <laughs> awesome well thank you for listening to the hunt back country podcast to access the show notes for this episode and subscribe to future episodes please visit exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast we value your feedback and would love to hear about any questions topic suggestions or comments you have our email address is podcast at exomountaingear.com. If you are enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. By doing so, you will be entered into our next Exo Mountain Gear swag giveaway. We are looking forward to the next episode and hope you are as well. <laughs>